Okay. So welcome again to another installment of Quantum Fluids in Isolation. Um, this week we have uh, Professor Grigory Valakovic from um, the Wiseman Institute. So Professor Valakovic got his master's degree from Novosibirskov uh, State University in 1981, and then he got his PhD from the same, from um, in 1984 from the Physics and Mathematics uh, Nuclear Physics Institute in Novo Osibirsk. He's um, been a professor at the Wiseman Institute from 2002 to present. And um, he's the recipient of many um, numerous awards, including um, he was selected as an outstanding referee at APS. He was awarded the Lavin Sean Honor a Prize in Physics uh, at the Wiseman Institute the award of the USSR Academy of Sciences Siberian Division and Excellence Prize of the USSR uh, Academy of Sciences. And today he'll be talking about the wonders of viscous electronics. So please help me in welcoming either by muting yourselves or by clapping virtually for Sir Gre uh, Gregory Velikovic. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, so I have to close my door. And uh, uh, even though it's already so late in the Institute, so thanks for having me. Uh, and um, uh, I've seen the program that you had a talk by Levitov. Uh, so this is a prequel in the sense that uh, Levitov uh, talk about some uh, more recent works. As, this, as you see, the last work here is appeared in 2019. So I'll try to tell kind of a prehistory of, um, of this work. And it's mostly will be on an elementary more or less fluid mechanical uh, level. I am fluid mechanicist, uh, even though I'm interested in other things, but um, uh, mostly it was uh, that someday Levitov came to me and asked me what, how we would know that electrons flow like a fluid, how we would uh, register this uh, doing some measurement. And uh, you see co-authors, unfortunately not all names are here, but um, some, uh, no, they're all names, but in, not in all papers. Uh, so I'll start from things that you know very well, just to put uh, things in perspective. Uh, generally, you know, high school uh, idea of uh, where Ohm's law come from is that you, at least I assume that there is uh, uh, an electric field and it uh, uh, accelerates electron and then electron hits something and uh, it flies during some time tau which is uh, kind of average time before it hits uh, some impurity or some um, atom displacement. And, uh, and then it stops, uh, loses its momentum, and then it uh, field accelerates it again. And this way, it's a perfectly Aristotelian world that velocity is proportional to the force uh, or current proportional to the electric field. Uh, and that's more or less the way I uh, uh, see that it's a, uh, 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 Ohm's law. And of course, when, uh, even though we often talk about current flowing, it's not the way fluids flow. Fluids flow completely differently. The particles, uh, fluids flow collectively, namely that particles of fluid exchange momentum much faster than they lose momentum to the outside, to either uh, lattice uh, or, or anything else. And uh, so generally, uh, usually it's not relevant because uh, uh, electrons, uh, uh, normally lose momentum to the lattice much faster. But there are some new materials and it's now very rapidly expanding the list of these materials. Initially it was only graphene and it's now, I just uh, referred paper about semi-metals and uh, there are many other system and the uh, Gali arsenide in which indeed the mobility is so high, namely the typical uh, gamma uh, P which is a rate uh, with which electrons change uh, loss momentum, uh, it's happened to be uh, smaller than the typical electron-electron inverse uh, uh, interaction time. And we start to hope that maybe we can look uh, and find regimes. And of course, uh, if electrons interact very uh, strongly, then the momentum would diffuse from one place to another. And that would be described by the diffusivity of momentum. The diffusivity of momentum is called uh, kinematic viscosity. Uh, it's a simple thing. It's something which has uh, a dimensionality of uh, V times L. So it's some typical velocity uh, times some typical mean free pass. Or if you wish, the, uh, it could be a typical C squares divided by some typical time. Uh, 
uh, generally it's a kinematic quantity it essentially centimeter square per second it tells you if you create let's say a vortex of that size how many seconds you need to diffuse it and for example air is 15 times more uh, diffusive than water so the same vortex in the air diffuses 15 times faster than uh, then in the water uh, it, because it's, it's a pure kinematic uh, thing it's not what characterizes forces it what characterizes the, uh, the diffusivity and uh, by uh, some uh, very early rough estimates you will see that it's actually very large in graphene it mostly it is large because uh, velocity the Fermi velocity is is pretty large uh, so that's a basic of uh, so this is a question that we started to ask ourselves some uh, four years ago how we would know that indeed it is such a regime. So in a sense, uh, in kind of simple uh, transport measurement without looking inside. And of course now, three years later, people started to really look inside. Uh, uh, and then they, you need some kind of elementary fluid mechanics for it. So uh, if we indeed assume that uh, the uh, momentum loss is negligible, then we come to usual hydrodynamics and then uh, typically in the hydrodynamics is a statement that the acceleration of a fluid particle dv over dt is a frisk, friction force and the gradient of some uh, thermodynamic potential which in this case will be just electrostatic potential uh, neglecting all other contribution into into pressure uh, and uh, 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 this is the equation it's a partially uh, uh, partial differential equation which some people spent life uh, trying to solve in different situations, myself including, but we will work with a very uh, simple version of it. Namely, we assume that the Reynolds number is very small and typically for what I will be uh, talking is a Reynolds number is uh, less than 10 to minus three. Uh, essentially, the Reynolds number is a ratio of a, uh, a friction term here to the nonlinear term. In a sense, this nonlinear term is an inertia of a fluid and uh, uh, small Reynolds number means that the diffusion is much faster. Everything happens instantaneously. You just make some changes. So, and immediately it's over there. So as long as you neglect inertia, you also must neglect time derivative because again, your diffusion is uh, the fastest game in town. And you see that uh, this equation is basically static. It's called Stokes equation. And it's not even Aristotelian world, it's a Stokes world. Namely, that you somehow uh, need to define what forces you uh, apply over there. And then uh, uh, the flow will organize itself in such a way that the viscous friction forces would balance your forces that you apply to it. It is as simple as possible. It's surprisingly non-trivial. Uh, I mean, this linear uh, uh, partial differential equation. And uh, uh, in particularly, it allow, it's, it's a pure geometry. There is no time anymore. Uh, when you look at a small uh, microorganisms, the way they flow uh, and the way they try to swim, it's not the way that we do it at high Reynolds number because we try to as fast as possible to push fluid backward. They do it in pure geometry. So they do something to their shape. And swimming is basically periodically changing shape. Uh, but after this period, you need to move. So you need to do it somehow in a uh, irreversible way in the space of your configuration. As this for your entertainment, I'm not going to dwell much about it. This is a famous personal swimmer, which tells you that if you start from such a form and you end with such a form, then you first move this arm, then you move that arm, then you return that arm, then you return that arm. You would shift. Uh, and that your shift would be proportional, of course, to the cycle in your configuration space where theta one, theta two, uh, angles and I leave it for your uh, home entertainment to guess in which direction uh, this personal swimmer would uh, swim. This is something which is really shows you that any reversible motion uh, would lead you to a death of hunger. Um, it's a, a small fish fry who tries to eat plankton, uh, trying to get it in, but then when it closes its mouth, it goes out. This is a perfect illustration of uh, reversibility of this motion. So you really need to do non abelian thing <laughs> if you really wanna. And 80%, by the way, they really starve uh, 
of hunger, so they did not uh, master this field. So all this is just an illustration. This this simple equation uh, hides uh, a very interesting and non-trivial geometry, of which we started to explore most elementary things. Uh, for now, and the first thing that uh, 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 Levitov and Levy did, we tried to answer this question, if current would indeed flow like a fluid, how we would know it. And so what we did, we did the simplest problem, we just put a source into the uh, uh, half space, and uh, at this end, assume that at infinity, the potential is zero, and the source uh, here puts some uh, delta potential, and that, this is a problem which you can immediately solve. And here is the solution. That's a, a, a potential. And you immediately recognize very interesting thing that if you really create such kind of, 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 of a potential, that the fluid flow, uh, which obtained from here, will be, of course, it, all unidirectional. It would go from source to infinity in whatever ways. But it would organize itself such that it would be fastest in this direction and it will be slowest in this direction. As a result, your distribution of potential will be such that the potential would change sign at 45 degrees. You see, it's negative over here and it's positive over here. Because it's zero at infinity, it means that the electric field is essentially looking towards the source here. And here, electric field uh, looks outside. So it's a pretty elementary physics, which tells you that the frictional flow is organized in such a way that fast moving pieces move uh, uh, by friction force uh, accelerate slower moving pieces over here. So electric field need to balance this uh, frictional force and uh, be directed against the car. So this is the most elementary thing that you can find, namely the breakdown of Ohm's law. Your current flows against the electric field. Of course, this is because uh, any viscous flow is essentially non-local. What really acts here is that fast current accelerates the slow one. And here are two solutions which are uh, a little bit different, but the, the main qualitative property, 45 degrees change of uh, sign is the same. Uh, and here is a little bit more uh, uh, realistic situation. Namely, you consider not an infinite half space, but you consider a, 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 a rectangle which is made out of uh, such material. And again, you have source and you have drain. And again, you see this 45 degrees change of sign. You see some how curious side vortices, which now depend on boundary condition, whether they uh, appear or not. So uh, these vortices are also, in a sense, a sign of a uh, uh, viscous flow, because ohmic flow, uh, given here for comparison, of course, would have no change of uh, sign of potential in any direction, it would have no sign vortices. So essentially, this was the first most elementary uh, computation that we did. And uh, uh, more or less, that was the uh, simple, I, I would say, elementary uh, statement made that uh, the negative voltage, essentially, or current flowing against the uh, voltage is the simplest manifestation that you really have uh, hydrodynamic regime. And uh, uh, in a sense, uh, you can, of course, do, and people uh, did real experiment with materials, but it's very much reminds, I briefly mentioned microfluidics. So if you consider a fluid which flows in between two layer, then your friction, uh, your bottom friction is uh, analog of Ohm's uh, 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 resistance and the viscous uh, friction between fluid layers in two dimensions it would be analog of, uh, of electrons exchanging momentum. So it's kind of analog. And we also did some experiments in uh, microfluidics. And you can see this type of flow that Levitov and uh, myself somehow predicted. Then was later uh, uh, a student did his diploma doing such microfluidic measurements and uh, supporting it. Uh, but here are uh, uh, back to more kind of electric measurements. This is a, a uh, what is called non-local response, because essentially that what uh, it just in, right in this time experimentalists were doing. So you uh, apply uh, your voltage between these two points, but you measure your uh, uh, voltage between some other points. And if we are right, 
you remember there is this magic 45 degrees, then right here, there would be voltage opposite in sign to voltage, which is here. Okay. That was basically a prediction. And uh, here are different curves which show that as you start from uh, ohmic term exactly equal to zero, here is the final size of your group, you indeed see that you have negative voltage everywhere. And then you see that as your ohmic term increases, this effect disappears. And eventually you would see it positive everywhere, but you see this kind of a dip, which is a memory of this viscous friction. And uh, uh, you've probably already uh, seen it some talk. This uh, picture, it's not our work, it's a work of uh, Manchester group, uh, which is done practically. So they not only predicted this phenomenon, they also measured it. And again, they did uh, basically the same thing. So they were running current I between this electrode and that electrode. This was a big gold electrode and this was a white is graphene. So current went this way and voltage was measured between these two sides. So this is the same uh, uh, trick with measuring side voltage and it was measured negative. And as being naive at the time, we decided and they decided that uh, this is indeed uh, necessarily hydrodynamic regime because one would uh, not expect this from uh, ohmic regime. For ohmic regime for sure you would not have current flowing uh, against uh, voltage or you would not have any negative uh, potential when you create your current by positive uh, source. And that at that moment, it was concluded that it is indeed a manifestation. And later the story happened to be a little bit more complicated because if you now consider this and try to compare your uh, hydrodynamic uh, 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 limit, not with the ohmic limit, but uh, with the ballistic limit, then you would recognize that if you have a source here and your probe is over there, then there is also a purely ballistic effect, which is in the fact that if your electrons just fly over here, so they would prevent some kind of other particles coming here, and they would also create an a, a, a opposite size of a voltage. Uh, and you can even compute the uh, uh, voltage, uh, the voltage which would be measured here in a purely ballistic regime, find out that it's purely negative, it decays. This is a, a behavior with a distance. And uh, uh, you would uh, also see how it depends on, uh, 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 on, on the parameters. Essentially, you may say that you would have here uh, uh, at the, you would have scale LEE, which is a scale of a electron-electron uh, interaction. And as you would be at scale small at electron electron interaction, that would you be in ballistic regime. And here your effect would be T squared over N. But if you go for sufficiently large distances, then you would get into a viscous regime. And then your effect will be proportional to viscosity, which means that essentially it will be proportional to the uh, collision rate of your electrons. And it will be proportional to the one over T square. So even though both ballistics and uh, uh, hydrodynamic regime create negative voltage. First of all, I mean, this is a shorter distance and it's stronger, but they also very differently depends on temperature. So by changing temperature, you can really try to distinguish one from another, which means that really uh, uh, establishing uh, where truly you go from a ballistic regime to a fluid regime where fluidity appears uh, really requires a more uh, sophisticated study. And that was done uh, next year. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is again, basically the same geometry. And then you can essentially measure what it's called here uh, resistance, but it's, it's basically this voltage which measured aside. So again, you run current this way and you measure voltage this way. And then you see, that as a function of, uh, uh, of a temperature, it really changes sign, okay? And this is uh, on the right side is a theory and the left side is experiment. And so uh, you can really identify this uh, transition, which is, which is not by a transition to the sign, namely here when it comes from positive to negative because it's negative both in ballistic, 
but, but where it passes through its minimum. Because it's essential is that here it is with temperature it goes one way, it here it with temperature goes other way. So it is this extremum, which is by the way is maximum of this effect. And it's very interesting, and it's something which maybe uh, deserves a more general uh, thing. So uh, viscosity, uh, I teach fluid mechanics, <laughs> I even wrote a textbook on the subject. Uh, uh, viscosity uh, is essentially, as we say, is proportional, uh, is velocity times mean free pass. And in your system, in, in electron system, it's Fermi velocity. So basically, you change mean free pass, right? And as you change mean free pass, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, your size of your apparatus is getting larger than it, and you get into fluid mechanical regime. But as you decrease mean free pass, you decrease viscosity. This is important thing, right? So it's actually the viscosity is largest as you enter the fluidity regime. Then when you go deeper and deeper into, into this your uh, hydrodynamic regime, you decrease mean free pass and your viscosity is getting smaller. So this is kind of, you know, darkness before down as we used to joke about it. This is really, uh, uh, it's a basic fluid mechanical phenomena, but somehow a little bit counterintuitive because uh, viscosity is a diffusivity, right? And as you're getting mean free pass smaller and smaller, it's more and more difficult to diffuse momentum. Right? You have, uh, if, you, if you operate with the same velocity. So again, this is a whole map uh, which shows you in the, uh, for graphene samples, uh, what in the temperature and, uh, uh, and uh, density uh, uh, plane where you can really absorb uh, negative uh, potential. And here it is this line, which actually it's, it's all negative here, but here is this line, which corresponds to this line of, of minimum, which shows you where indeed uh, fluidity appears, where you go from ballistic to viscous regime. You can do it either by... Uh, by increasing temperature, or you can go in by decreasing current density. And uh, uh, this is a theory and experiment. They aren't exactly uh, quantitatively the same, but they're very similar qualitatively. And uh, so in this, in this sense, the uh, true establishment of hydrodynamic regime is transport measurement is was rather done uh, at this point and not just by observing uh, negative uh, voltage. Um, and uh, uh, quick yes. question, super question. Okay, I prefer back. questions uh, all the time. You better interrupt me all the way. Yeah, I, I said, can you go back one slide? Yes. And I see an experiment at, at zero uh, carry density, charge neutrality, there's this red stuff that you don't predict. Please. Uh, uh, Say it again because I, I uh, it was not very I, good. I see uh, in the panel A experiment yes. a charge neutrality, uh, a red. Uh, yeah, wait. Plume. Panel A is this one. You mean? No. Uh, yeah. No. I mean in the uh, colorful uh, pictures. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. You see what I mean? There's red thing in experiment and not in theory. What, what, what is going on there? Yeah, we did not treat uh, theoretically this uh, in neutrality oh, point. Yeah. The, and, yeah, and also experimentally, it's kind of uh, something which is kind of goes beyond all these types of consideration. So I would rather, I would think that this is uh, everything just, we did just, is, this, is, is, sort of is far enough thing. from yeah, far yeah. enough from neutrality. Absolutely. Oh, no yeah. momentum conservation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then there were uh, other experiments which I will probably skip. This is uh, uh, kind of the same year, but again, it's a trying and, and, and indeed very, uh, very uh, beautiful measurement of the uh, distribution of, uh, of a, a potential depending on the different geometrical uh, things. And uh, uh, again, it's not our work, so I would not, I, I don't try to comment. I just want you to know that such type of measurements are really possible where you could really not only do what we did in our work, namely measure potential on the side, but you can really do kind of a, a area measurements of the potential. Uh, and now I want to comment of something which was uh, even a little bit earlier than that. And this is uh, not a current measurement, but uh, well, current measurement too, but it's also another transport measurement, which is a measurement of a heat conductivity. And uh, uh, there is a, uh, somehow uh, what is called weidemann france law, which I never understood why it's a law, because it's kind of something which is, but it's empirically very well uh, uh, 
uh, check this name is that if you take a, a heat conductivity and divide it by electric conductivity and temperature, you get something which, if I remember right, is called Lorentz number. And for a free electron gas, you can kind of uh, compute it, uh, how much every electron keep uh, uh, this and keep that. And you can get this number and uh, it's uh, all the materials, it's actually not a single picture. It's this picture, it's about 2.5. Then this picture is about 2.5. You see, most of materials are essentially uh, kind of live near this line. So it looks like a law of nature, um, even though it's just derived for a free electron gas uh, for, uh, and any Fermi model. But then uh, you start thinking that if indeed you have a strong interaction between carriers, uh, then when you uh, measure heat conductivity, your electrons and hole go the same way. Uh, but if you measure a uh, current, they go opposite ways. And when they go opposite ways, if they interact, there would be in, uh, a friction. The momentum of this would diffuse with it. So essentially, it would mean that your current conductivity will be less comparing to your heat conductivity. So uh, this way, you may try to indeed uh, 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 find this uh, value larger than the Lorentz number, which you find for Fermi uh, liquid and for, for Drude gas. And that's what um, uh, Casey Fong really did. This is the measurements. And this is the measurements indeed of thermal conductivity. And this is precisely this kind of number. So that would be a, a true weidemann franz law. And you see approximately in the same interval of temperature on this color picture that I've shown you, this is a pretty uh, wide range of temperature uh, for graphene samples uh, between like 30, 40 degrees Kelvin up to 150. You see a huge, uh, well, large, let's say, large uh, uh, increase of thermal conductivity with respect to electric conductivity. And this is, of course, another transport measurement which indirectly but uh, shows you that there is a strong exchange of momentum inside uh, this system. Uh, and uh, then uh, one may ask uh, 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 next question on the same direction. So indeed, if carriers do interact uh, with each other, and uh, how it can change uh, uh, resistance uh, for a given particular geometry. And in particular, there are two kinds of uh, uh, resistance that one can imagine. One is uh, uh, of uh, uh, scattering on phonons, and another is scattering on uh, impurities on boundaries, which is essentially impurity is kind of another uh, kind of boundary. And uh, uh, we would now address the case B. Because again, this is something about uh, fluid mechanics. This is what uh, fluid mechanics usually do. We have pipes, you know, and we're interested in how much momentum we lose to the pipe. I mean, how 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 much we need to pay to to pump oil from from here to there. And this is that type of question. And so, in particular, we would like to ask that if I just take a, a sample and start increasing the interaction of electrons with each other, keeping everything else the same, what would happen to this uh, second B part of resistance? Could I make my resistance much, much larger or much, much smaller? Can I make uh, it uh, uh, smaller, for example, than in the ohmic regime? So this is essentially what we ask uh, this question. We ask about the ohm this guy who does not let you go. And essentially we will be talking about uh, uh, the resistance which is due to boundaries. And in the uh, uh, jumping over, uh, over very uh, big uh, and, and interesting subject, I would just mention that if you just have a, 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 gay, a kind of a, a what's called point contact or just channel, which is uh, really ballistic, namely that as your particle flies through it without any, uh, 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 without single scattering and interaction with other particle, then you still, uh, it presents a resistance and that resistance is related to its width. W is the width of this channel. It's by the way, it's the same formula, but of course, without H bar is in the Knudsen regime of an ideal gas because essentially your typical uh, resistance is proportional to the time by which you lose momentum. And your typical time is uh, your uh, width of your channel divided by your typical velocity. It's a very classical consideration. And of course, the formula, which I write here, the Sharvin uh, uh, formula, it's a uh, it's quantum formula, essentially it tells you 
how much energy, how much potential difference you need to squeeze quantum particle through this uh, uh, opening. But uh, uh, the main uh, message is the same, uh, is proportional to the width, linearly. That's important, okay? And this is a ballistic resistance, both cl classical and quantum. The other numbers are different, but in a diffusive regime, in a viscous regime, it's of course quadratic. Because now, uh, when your electron or whatever carrier needs uh, goes through the multiple scattering, so it takes time uh, when it reaches the uh, wall and, and loses its momentum there, quadratic in W. So now it just uh, gives you quadratic dependence, which means that as you increase W, when it's much less than the mean free pass, you would be on the ballistic regime, you would be linear. But then when you go up there and it will be W, which is larger, then it will be, uh, uh, you will be in the uh, viscous regime. And in the viscous regime, it will be much smaller because it's decay like one over V square. So you would see resistance, which is essentially much, much smaller than what would you expect uh, by assuming that you live in this regime. And that's a simple prediction. Uh, it essentially could be found in many different papers as I uh, kind of learn this time. Uh, we did this prediction in this uh, uh, 17 paper uh, uh, with two uh, Levitov students. And essentially it is this argument that I've just made that if in the ballistic regime, your conductivity would be proportional to W in the viscous regime, it will be W squared. And as you go from one to another, you would see a super ballistic uh, uh, thing. And the physics of it is pretty similar, simple. And now fortunately we have beautiful images that people really see this. Uh, and it is related to the fact that in the ballistic regime, your distribution of currents is essentially flat. So if you look uh, of a current density as a function of this coordinate, that in the uh, extreme ballistic limit is just flat. As the interactions start to appear, then the particle near the wall, they lose their momentum and they slow down and then they start to slow down another particle. First, it's a weak effect, but then eventually it's getting stronger. And in the viscous limit, when you mean free pass much, much smaller than the W, then the width, you would see a poisel uh, parabolic profile, which now, uh, not back then, it's 17, but by now is beautifully observed in Weizmann and Harvard into things. Uh, but as a result, when you form poisel profile, there is much less carriers near the wall. And that's the mechanism of losing resistance. And of course, engineers who work with gases, they knew it uh, for about maybe 100 years. So if you take a pipe and you work with a really rare gas, it has some resistance. When you start to increase your density without changing your temperature, then you would see that your resistance of this gas to of, of this pipe to the gas drops down. And uh, this is essentially this phenomenon, which again, due to the same fact that in one case, the time of flying proportional to the uh, width and another case is proportional to the width squared. And as a result, if you measure resistance as a function of concentration, uh, just you increase pressure, you increase concentration and you see that it drops down. So, uh, and uh, uh, it's the same you would have if your boundary are actually scatterers which uh, uh, distributed everywhere and you lose momentum by uh, coming to the scatterers. And here it's an interesting, thing. again, the mechanism is the same how you, uh, uh, when interaction between particle appears, how you actually decrease resistance, the particle which scattered on your scatterer prevents other particle from scattering on it and lose momentum. It's the same mechanism as it, near the wall. It has a beautiful uh, part, uh, which is related to dimensionality. Namely, this is actually logarithmic enhancement uh, uh, due to uh, scattering. So, this would what you would guess uh, naively, but then you get this viscous uh, addition to uh, conductivity and it has a logarithm and it has this uh, curious uh, uh, length, which I probably uh, won't have time to, to comment much, but it's you can find in our paper. It was unexpected for me. I mean, uh, and uh, this is an experimental device where this was uh, actually measured. Namely, here you can find gates 
a different gaze with the different sizes. You see this getting wider and wider as you go down. And so here you can really study dependence on this W. Of course, this picture is purely theoretical. It's much later than people really measured uh, uh, this uh, thing. But first you can do it at a really very low temperature. This is 2K measurement. You can indeed see that it uh, satisfies this ballistic formula dependence on the concentration as it should be. Uh, you can really see that it's also linear in size. And then you can start increasing temperature. As, as you increase temperature, then your uh, mean free pass decreases. You increase interaction of electrons because this is a Fermi thing. And you really see this is a, your ballistic value. And you see that you really go super ballistic. So resistance drops uh, below ballistic limit. And only at sufficiently high temperature, over 120, 130 Kelvin, it started going up, apparently because of uh, scattering by uh, uh, phonons. But it's a pretty wide region where you uh, really can go through the needle uh, in a super ballistic way uh, due to the interaction between electrons. And uh, uh, this phenomenon can be studied uh, in much detail in comparing theory with experiment and see that it's really uh, as a function of W squared of the width, it's a linearly, it's indeed quadratic function. And uh, I would probably uh, skip it as this. And uh, somewhat later, but uh, in a very convincing way, as there were measurements, this is the Weizmann group, but we now also have Harvard uh, measurement and also in different materials. Uh, so this is indeed visualization uh, uh, of, uh, current flow, and you see that at a relatively low temperatures where you would expect ballistic regime, it's a pretty flat distribution of current. And when you increase temperature, you see a pretty uh, uh, strong uh, distribution of current. So in this respect, uh, this is kind of the first direct visualization of, uh, of what really happens uh, over there. Uh, and the technique of measurement, there are two, two different techniques uh, in Harvard and at Weizmann, and they more or less uh, give similar results. And I think that we could be pretty confident now uh, about uh, that matter. Uh, so now I want to switch from uh, 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 experiments back to theory and ask what else we can predict uh, from uh, uh, doing relatively elementary uh, uh, viscous fluid mechanics. Uh, you know, for 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 person like me, it's unbelievable gift uh, that you can go back to 19th century and do something which you would believe Stokes did. You know, I spent like six hours reading everything Stokes wrote about it, and he missed a couple of things. And it would be you know electronics, so people can really do electronic experiments with this. It's just, I mean, unbelievable gift. Well, thanks thanks to Levit to a large extent. Anyway, so what uh, uh, now I want to comment is about some kind of uh, a relatively simple but interesting new effect, which again comes from comparison of ohmic and viscous case. So ohmic uh, essentially, as long as we have uh, uh, neutrality, so our flow is uh, uh, is potential and it, and it, it it's, it's essentially in, in incompressible and potential. And so if we introduce in two dimensions streamlines of this flow, namely it says that your V is kind of a, a, a two dimensional curl of your stream function. So the stream function and potential, they are a brother and sister in Cauchy Riemann condition. So essentially ohmic flow is a conformal invariant. And this was exploited uh, many times and, and engineers can do beautiful tricks with, with this conformal invariance. But in this course flow, it's different because now uh, if you look at this relation, it's Laplacian of V, which is a gradient of potential, right? Even though you can still uh, may introduce a stream function, but your velocity is not potential anymore. Uh, as, which means that the curl of velocity, which is vorticity is non-zero. And curl of velocity, by the way, has nothing to do with vortices. There is often this misunderstanding. Of course, vortices uh, have vorticity, but some vortices don't have vorticity. Vorticity means that every fluid element rotates as it moves. You, your flow could have perfectly straight lines. As long as it, it has gradient of velocity across it, it has vorticity because every element rotates as it moves. Okay, And viscous flows are essentially all like this they are having vorticity and it is now vorticity 
which is uh, related to the uh, and if you look at stream function it, it satisfies p harmonic equation which of course elasticity people i mean solve for living for last for last hundred years and still there are things which are uh, i was uh, kind of unexpectedly discovered and one of them is pretty elementary it's even now a subject of a textbook um, so if we just look at the flow out of a spherical source okay of course in two dimensions it will be one over r right or in d dimension will be one over r d minus one just because of incompressibility of my fluid because of mass conservation uh the trick is that the laplacian of one over r in 2d is zero right and uh, it's zero which means that my viscous force which is laplacian v is zero right which means that it's this flow everywhere flows without any friction friction force is zero right on the other hand the stress tensor which is a velocity gradient of course is non-zero velocity uh, uh, decays with r if you differentiate it you find then if you then compute your viscous dissipation it's non-zero in every point okay so uh this at that point i went to the library and took five volumes of stocks and asked myself where stocks wrote about it no nowhere uh well stocks noticed it but in, in a different uh, uh, point in the in the in, in the gravity wave on the water so in a sense you ask okay guys who does this work right because we have dissipation at every point and friction is equal to zero which means that of course your potential is constant or your pressure is constant so there is no electric field and and then it took some time for us and that what we did with uh, Andrei Shitov and Michal Shavit, a PhD student, we understood that it's actually the, uh, the voltage drop happens on a source. That's where you do work to push your carriers outside. And Stokes never considered such problem because for him, a source of a flow inside the fluid was pretty artificial. Now for electronics, it's pretty natural. <laughs> you just put an electrode there and it flows. Uh, but you need to do work if you do it in a spherically symmetric way. And then we derived with uh, Andrei and Michal this, uh, again, quite unexpected fast formula that the drop of potential uh, is proportional to the current, the V, which goes out and to the curvature of the source. And in a moment, I comment uh, how it would actually uh, be transported. But as long as we consider a spherical uh, uh, situation, what we come to the conclusion that in a purely viscous flow, in a radially symmetric case, here is your potential on your uh, electrode. Here, let's say I have zero potential in the outside. Then what I predict is that the potential must be constant inside. There is no other way. It's a, a flow for which Laplacian V equal to zero. And then I've realized that the potential must actually behave this way. It must have this negative jump when I go through the positive curvature, but it must have positive jump when I go through the negative curvature. In a sense, I need to push electrons by this negative jump of potential so that it would come out. And here I need to slow it down so that it would kind of join another electron and it would need an electric field in a small, of course, the mean free pass layer. This is where uh, kinetics happen in this layer. And if you, of course, reverse your current, then you would have a different uh, voltage uh, uh, separation. And of course, now people try to measure it because this is something which seems unbelievably simple. And then, uh, uh, I mean, even uh, kind of we did not believe it for a while. Uh, and then again, for comparison, here, we, if we take ellipsoid, of course, it's a little bit different because the curvature now is changing. And this is just illustration that what Michal solved this problem, what you would see comparing the viscous flow and ohmic flow. In ohmic flow, of course, uh, near the, when the curvature is largest, that's where your uh, uh, field is strongest. So you push it stronger, the current is largest over there. And the current is smallest near the flat parts. And of course, it's completely different over here. Uh, you have really small current where the curvature is large because here you have an opposite side of uh, a electric field it's again this changing of a, of a sign of potential and all, most of your current in in viscous fluid of course prefers to flow in a parallel straight lines because it's where friction is smallest so you would see that the maximal current would go from a flat spaces and you also see this completely different distribution 
on the other hand, what it predicts and what people now, uh, at least in two groups, uh, try to measure is that as long as you would be passing to the uh, 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 hydrodynamic regime, increasing effectively interaction, that you would see expulsion of the electric field, namely flattening of your potential. You would uh, more or less see how essentially you would come from such a distribution into a distribution which would be flatter and flatter over here. Okay, and of course, this jump is 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 inversely proportional to the curvature, to the uh, radius, and, and directly proportional to the curvature. Uh, I think it's an interesting phenomena, and uh, it's, uh, 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 it's time to ask this question, which kind of there is a kind of an old Russian tradition. Well, at least at least in this part of Landau School, which was in Kharkov, where was people uh, at the end always asked what where was the cheating, and if the speaker tried to say that no, I was completely honest with you, then uh, it was said no, no, no. Then we are mathematicians, we are physicists, so there must be cheating somewhere. And uh, of course, uh, this is, uh, in a sense, uh, what I told you, uh, it's kind of too good to be true. I uh, used uh, elementary uh, fluid mechanics, essentially linear response theory, uh, trying to describe behavior of strongly interacting quantum particles in uh, very complicated materials or on scales which are there are kind of no small, uh, really no small parameters here. To, uh, so, uh, and spin was completely disregarded in all this, this picture uh, and the quantum nature of particles too. So I think that it is essentially, uh, on the one hand, the kind of maybe the most basic argument for this, why this miracle sometimes happen of this nature is that hydrodynamics is essentially a very uh, robust macroscopic science. It describes some, it essentially it's a kind of, it's a bunch of conservation law and we treated so far only momentum conservation law and essentially try to describe it by diffusion and it kind of works surprisingly well uh, without much sensitivity to the details. Uh, but uh, I think that the moment we start to look closer and closer then we see how, I mean, real picture is really uh, much more complicated. So uh, let me wrap it up and leave time for questions. Uh, so first of all, that indeed there is now more or less we are convinced that the electrons can flow like a, a fluid, at least like in laminar fluid. We really see how this fluidity appears and it happened to be more complicated than we expected. So even though the boundary between ohmic and hydrodynamic regime is pretty simple. So you just need to compare uh, uh, viscosity and, uh, and ohmic resistivity. They have different dimensionality. There is a, uh, a squared length between them. So you can say that, well, if you have a, a, a system at large scale, your ohmic uh, uh, contribution would dominate and at small scale, your viscous contribution would dominate. But the boundary between uh, uh, hydrodynamic and ballistic regime is much, much less trivial. And you, as you've heard in Levitov's talk, which told you about actually how non-trivial is really here the interaction between particle and that there is a, a whole uh, hierarchy of relaxation time. So I think that this boundary is uh, really uh, will be explored both more theoretically and more experimentally. But as long as we really go into this uh, fluid mechanical regime, then we indeed see this negative resistance and it has a maximum upon the onset of fluidity. We see super ballistic conductance, which is uh, kind of not uh, so much surprising for engineers who do gas dynamics, but it's really a kind of uh, make ecstatic uh, some uh, solid uh, uh, state uh, people. And uh, we see the breakdown of conformal invariance, which we used to have for ohmic flow. It's kind of broken into the viscous flow. We see free flowing currents without any uh, electric fields inside. So some different wonders of uh, viscous electronics. So let me stop at this point and take questions. Thank you. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, they can get on mute themselves or they can raise their hand.
I see some steerings, but not. Yep. So any questions at all? So I actually had um, maybe one or two questions. So a lot of discussions that I've seen that talk about electron hydrodynamics talks about life at low Reynolds number, right? So what about life at high Reynolds number? So how can we push this to understand like turbulence in a quantum? Yeah, well, curve? it's uh, of course the first thing that people uh, uh, know about fluid mechanics, the turbulence is very interesting. And uh, even though I can imagine that uh, uh, nonlinear effects will be important and pretty soon, uh, I don't think that would be a, a usual fluid uh, mechanical nonlinearity, which is essentially inertia. So if you look at Navier-Stokes equations and you uh, see that the nonlinear term there, it's, it's basically inertia. And I think that this would be uh, uh, mostly relevant in, uh, in these systems because uh, first of all, I think that some maybe more important things. So if you just look at Navier-Stokes equation, uh, uh, I think that the effects related to the local heating, because viscosity is a, uh, is a, it's, it's a proportional to electron-electron interaction. Electron-electron interaction is strongly dependent on temperature. So if you have a very uh, inhomogeneous current and you have a large gradient of velocity, that's where you produce local heating. But where you produce local heating, you will be changing viscosity. So I think that this is the simplest possible mechanism of nonlinearity which is nothing like we've seen in fluid mechanics. So I don't think it's interesting to model, to model usual turbulence. You just go open your kitchen sink and just see all this turbulence. It's easy, you don't need all this stuff. We can have a totally new uh, hydrodynamic nonlinearity. And this is only just one example. There will be other things related to the quantum nature of particle and, and to other things. But at least this local heating uh, which would change viscosity, which means immediately make your viscose term nonlinear. Well, that's a beauty. I mean, I would I would love to see somebody trying to do such an experiment because, you know, this is this is really new hydrodynamics and new turbulence. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I believe in a little bit later in the slides you define the Reynolds number for the electron electron yes. system. That's, yeah, that's a Reynolds number, which is essentially a typical velocity oh. time typical scales divided by your viscosity. And because your viscosity is your Fermi velocity times mean free pass, so you see that this is your current velocity divided by Fermi velocity, and that's your scale divided by LEE. That's your Reynolds number. And so far, mm -hmm. it's pretty small. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Okay. Fermi velocity is large. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So, uh, yeah, I have just a quick question. Uh, first of all, um, great presentation, Professor. Thank you for that. Um, when it comes to, so I've seen some very interesting work in computational fluid dynamics with accelerating at least basic Eulerian fluid flow, but accelerating different, well, yeah, accelerating the basic CFD computations using machine learning and inferring the answer to, let's say, the Poisson pressure step equation. When you're doing that, it's a very computationally intensive step, and you can actually infer the solution rather than computing it using, let's say, Jacobi iterations or what have you. So there have been speed ups that I've seen in practice for certain classes of computational fluid dynamics that you can gain from using machine learning the right way. Uh, I'm wondering, though, would those same methods uh, be useful here in solving the underlying PDEs? I imagine not. There, there's clearly some mathematical differences. Has there been any research in this area? Yeah, actually, uh, it, it, people try, and it's 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 a very actively pursued direction that you uh, instead of just uh, because uh, uh, turbulence. I mean, not in graphene, but you know, any cloud is far beyond any possibilities of our computers. Just, I mean, uh, a, a piece of, of fluid like 10 by 10 meters, we cannot model it uh, at, a, uh, at a Reynolds number, which are interesting. So people are really trying to use uh, the things like machine learning for a more effective modeling in the sense that you, you kind of try to model much less, but get much more out of it. So far, I did not see 
something which would really uh, make me jumping, but I think it's a, it's 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 the right direction, because okay, otherwise we would never go into this Reynolds number where we want to be computationally. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe I'll wait um, three or four seconds in case anyone wants to unmute. Uh, what you want me to unmute? Uh, huh? No, I just, I just was waiting a few seconds in case anybody wants to unmute. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, in this point. Mm -hmm. um, so let's maybe thank Professor Falakovic again. Thank you very much. And uh, it's pretty late here, so I would. Uh, with around home. Thanks again for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Goodbye. Welcome. Bye. Bye.